Okay. Amen, amen, amen. We have uh, hands to raise, holy hands to raise to God. And remember those sacred and beautiful palms of Jesus, which were nailed to that cross for us. And uh, so I thank Teresa for that message. And as she said, you can see uh, uh, Riley's message on YouTube this afternoon. Uh, the beauty of recording it right now is that I got 29 minutes, and uh, that's it. So uh, we can get out of here. At, yeah, right. Or I can just go and stop it and start a new one. Uh, no honks? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to uh, continue through the book of Joshua. And last week we talked about taking the week to sanctify ourselves and how uh, uh, that's a process of, of going through and maybe taking a tally and asking God to reveal to us. Uh, as the psalm says, search me, O God, and know me. Reveal any secret thoughts. Reveal any secret sins to me. And uh, confessing our sin. God who is faithful and just will forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. To those who have believed and become sons of God, we have instant forgiveness. As soon as we recall sin, we bring it to God's throne of grace. We say, this is, this is filthy. This is, uh, this is enslaving me. This is an affront to you and your righteousness and your holiness, and I want it gone. And God forgives us, and we can just thank and praise him for that. Uh, this week, we're going to uh, just barely get across the river and uh, continue. And so I've got a point to make about that. And then I've got to go back to chapter 2 and talk about the spies and Rahab. So God helping us, uh, we'll get through some of these things, and God will uh, really bless it to our hearts this, uh, this week. I do want to acknowledge the fact that there's a lot of churches around that have a lot of difficult decisions to make about how and when and if to do worship, and, and is it online, is it uh, in drive-ins, some churches are even still meeting in person, and uh, the, the fact is that there's a lot of freedom in Christ, and I thank God for that freedom, I thank God that he blesses us as we uh, muddle and stumble along, and that uh, as Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, acknowledge him in all our ways, and he shall direct our paths. Uh, and the fact is that uh, with this Christian freedom, there's no scripture about how to do and be church during a pandemic. It just doesn't exist. And so we're asking God to guide us, and, and, and even if, uh, whether to hear his voice or just have him turn us and, and send us in the right direction without even knowing that it's him doing it, but just to make sure that we're doing church uh, safely and appropriately and prudently in these times. So I uh, thank God for guiding us and guiding all the other churches that are making some very difficult decisions about how to do things. Uh, a couple other points, uh, real quick, is that the uh, FM transmitter we're using uh, to broadcast right now, uh, we purchased that about three and a half, four years ago uh, for the hearing impaired. And we have these little pocket radios that people could plug their earbuds into and tune into the station that we're on right now and listen to the service in the sanctuary. And, and some people uh, availed themselves of that, but not many. And there was uh, a time when I wondered whether I had wasted the church's money. And... <laughs> Uh, here we are, using it uh, to God's glory and to the church's good. So, yeah. And uh, one other point, I, uh, I, uh, God blessed me uh, several years ago uh, to get the camera that's to my left. And uh, I... I, I my intention and how I've used it is to take pictures of wildlife and eagles and uh, uh, elk up in uh, ben Bennington, uh, Bensington, whatever that place is called. And... Uh, uh, the Blue Angels and the Thunderbirds when they fly overhead at air shows. And uh, when the camera came out, everyone was talking about, it takes great video. And I looked at the reviews, and I looked at the write-ups, and I looked at the specifications, and I said, I don't care, I'm never going to use video. And there it is, taking video. We took video of the praise team yesterday and last week as they sang God's, uh, to God's glory and, and posted it on YouTube. So I'm thankful that even when I don't know what's coming, God does. When we don't know what's coming, God does. All right. Chapter 3. He had commanded the people to prepare victuals and to uh, purify themselves, to sanctify themselves. And then God gives uh, Joshua some commands in chapter 3 and verse 8. You shall command the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, you shall stand still in Jordan. 
And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come hither and hear the words of the Lord your God. And uh, so he gave them the instructions. He gave them the encouragement that God was going to, without fail, drive out the, the Canaanites, the Amorites, and Jebusites. And he said, Hold on, you wait for the ark to go ahead, and we'll follow the ark. But that ark was borne up by four priests on two staves, and uh, one on each end of each stave, four priests total, and they were to cross into the river first. And I will uh, just throw this out there. If you are in or ever want to be in any kind of ministry for God and to the glory of, of Christ and to the benefit of his church, you go first. You don't sit back and tell others where they need to go. You lead the way. If you're a preacher, you do first what you're going to tell other people they need to do on Sunday. If you're a deacon, uh, you, give, you, you uh, arrange your family and your home and your life in such a way that when you counsel someone else about what they need to do, they can look at you as an example. If you are a minister for Jesus Christ, you get in the water first. You break the ground. Then he said uh, that they uh, went in. They dipped in the brim of the water. The Jordan overflows all her banks at the time of the harvest. The waters which came down in verse 16 from above stood and rose up upon an heap very far from the city Adam. That is before, uh, besides Zertan. Uh, I think, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, Ed Jones looked this up during our Bible study several weeks ago, and I think this is about 15 or 20 miles to the north, uh, this city of Adam. But uh, spiritually, it speaks to us that when Christ stems the flood, the tide of sin, the tide of destruction, the tide of, of filthy wickedness in this world, it goes all the way back to the first man. Uh, he doesn't uh, leave anything unchecked. No sin was unpaid for. No curse was, was, uh, was unaccounted for. Everything from the time that Adam and Eve took the first bite of that forbidden fruit was erased when Christ died for us on the cross. The flood was stemmed all the way back to Adam. And so uh, the first Adam brought sin and destruction and death upon us. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, brought life and passage into his promised land. And I'm thank thankful that Christ stood in those floodwaters and made them stand up in a heap and said, I'll take the curse on me all the way back to Adam. So they stood in the waters, and the, uh, the priests uh, that bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, in verse 17, stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. So they stood there. They led the way and cleared the way and made the way, and they stood there as the people went by on their way. That's the ministers of Jesus Christ what you and I are to be about. Make sure that others get safe passage. Okay, uh, we're going to stop there as it pertains to the crossing of the River Jordan. Next week we'll talk about, well not next week, but uh, as we continue in our series we'll talk about the, the placing, the stacking of the stones in the river and out of the river and what that pretends, but we go back to chapter 2 and I really want to hone in on this. Chapter 2 they sent spies in verse 1. Two men to spy secretly. Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went, and they came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. Uh, as I looked through Scripture in the concordance, there were seven, seven places in the Bible where I was sure we were talking about Rahab of Jericho. Seven times her name is mentioned. And five of those times, it associates the word harlot with her name even in Hebrews and James in the New Testament. And the other two times that it doesn't say harlot, uh, that word is within two or three verses either direction. So God continually, through his word, reminds us where she came from and what she was up to before she found redemption. Uh, remember what Joshua said, or what uh, God had instructed uh, Joshua, he said, uh, to to uh, store my word, to read my word, to meditate on my word, and ultimately to go walk in my word and to turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. He said, forget what the people around you are doing. You come straight after me. Don't deviate, don't alternate, don't speed up or slow down, and whatever you do, don't turn, just go straight with me in my commandments. 
in, we talked about last week how there are seem to be uh, two political wings, a right wing and a left wing. Uh, and sadly, both those wings are flapping on the same bird. Uh, but theologically, there are also a right hand and a left. We talk about theology, doctrine, and practice. There are a right hand and a left hand. And we're going to view, look at both of those. So they went across, they met Rahab. Rahab hid the two spies when the, when the uh, leaders or elders of Jericho came looking for them. And she said in verse 12, Now therefore I pray you swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token, and that you will save alive my father, my mother, my brother, and my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. And so, uh, and so she said, I know who I am, and I know where you found me, but I want to be saved. And so the men said, our, our life for yours, if you do not utter this our business. That is, don't tell, tell the people where we went after we leave here. Uh, it shall be when the Lord hath given us the land, we will deal kindly and truly with thee. So they said, yes, you've asked for salvation, you will receive salvation. And in verse 17 it says, we will be blameless of this thine oath, which we have made, that, uh, made you swear, Behold, when we come into the land, you shall bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which thou didst let, let us down by, and shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all unto thy, uh, thy father's household home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head, and we will be guiltless. And whoever shall be with thee in thine house, uh, his blood shall be upon our head, if any hand be upon him." So he, they told her, here's your way out. Take the scarlet thread by which you let us down and hang it in the window, and anyone in these walls, anyone protected by this scarlet line will be saved. They will not, uh, no harm come to them, not if but when the walls fall down, because in our lives we are uh, destined for destruction. We're born into a fallen world, we're born into a sinful world, and we have, uh, uh, are sinful creatures from birth. Uh, the Psalm uh, 51 says, I was born in sin and conceived in iniquity. There's no escaping it. At some point in our lives, those well-crafted, uh, carefully polished walls will come down and destruction will be the order of the day, unless we have the scarlet thread in the window. So here's where Christians deviate to the right or the left hand. You have people who say, you've got to have the blood, and you do. You've got to have the blood. As the men told Rahab, so Jesus tells us, I will be quit of this my oath to you if you do not claim the blood. If you do not believe by faith that I died for your sins according to the scriptures, that I was buried and rose again according to the scriptures, and believe on me as your sole source of salvation and life, I will be quit of my oath because you did not claim my blood. That's the right hand. And then the left hand is look who they're talking to. Look where she's been. Look where she's from. Look what she's been doing with her life. Look at her reputation. Look at what the people around her know about her. They knew that when there were visitors, they should come uh, to the city, they should come see her because she was the, uh, kind of the gossip queen in town. And so, uh, and so on the left hand, you say, uh, as Jesus himself said, and as the book of Revelation says, whosoever is a thirst, let him come and drink freely of the water of life. And so you have people that, that walk it right in the middle of that, according to God's word and God's command, and they say, I don't care where you're from, I don't care what you've been doing, I don't care about your past, I don't care about your sins, I don't care about your reputation, God is inviting you to come along. And then they say, but he will be quit of his oath if you do not claim the blood. Without the blood, there is no remission. Without the blood, there's no forgiveness. Without the blood, there's no salvation. God will be quit of his promise to save you if you don't claim the blood. 
And so I asked three questions today of myself and everyone gathered here uh, by radio and on tele uh, telephone. Uh, have we claimed the blood? Have you claimed the blood? Not the great teachings, not the kindness, not the loaves and fishes, not the healings, uh, not the deliverances, not the lame people that got up and walked uh, that, uh, at Jesus' command, have you claimed the blood? Have you claimed the blood? Not the blood of bulls and goats, but the blood of God's only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. There is one blood that can and will and does save, and that is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And third, have you claimed the blood? Not are you around people that have claimed the blood. Not do you go to a church that talks about claiming the blood. Not have your parents and grandparents claim the blood. Have you, have I, claimed the blood of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ? If not, amen, amen. If not, God will be quit and blameless of his oath to save. I worked uh, under, I, I served as an intern in my seminary education under a pastor. And I say this with all sincerity, not, I'm not speaking uh, in hyperbole. I believe uh, he is not only saved, it's, it's obvious to me, I saw Christ in him so many different ways. Uh, not only saved, I believe he is a better Christian and a better pastor than I will ever hope to be. However, in his church, he leaned to the left. He welcomed everyone. His, his church uh, faithfully and fervently sought the homeless and the sick and the poor and the, and the hungry to serve and to bless and to invite uh, to follow after Jesus. And, and again, he's a better Christian and pastor than I'll ever be, but what I, what I looking back, saw missing was the blood. I did not see an invitation, in fact, a challenge to the lame, the poor, the hungry, the homeless to apply the claim the blood of Jesus Christ for themselves. Then I was, I've been in churches where they absolutely set the standard high. I mean, uh, women had to wear long dresses, men could not wear shorts, could not have long hair, uh, you couldn't watch certain programs on TV, you couldn't allow certain liquids to pass between your lips, uh, you couldn't watch, uh, probably shouldn't watch any movies at all, and of course, uh, high and lofty, they, they, they magnified the blood of Jesus Christ. But if anyone like Rahab showed up in the church, she would be uninvited. She would not be welcome. Uh, we know your reputation. We know what you've done in our neighborhood, in our community. Uh, we don't know that God can do anything for you. Uh, we don't believe you're, you've been invited. And, and here we are as Christians, blood bought, blood washed, denying others the very forgiveness and salvation that we received from a gracious and loving God. And so I, I uh, want to challenge our church. I believe that we believe and hold fast to the fact that there is no salvation, uh, there is no other name given under heaven by which men must be saved than that of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think we all believe that here. But I want to challenge us, not only when people like Rahab might show up by accident on Sunday, but to go out and, and intentionally seek people that the world says are unsavable, that the world says are unforgivable, that the world says uh, their reputation is beyond re uh, repair. And, and I, my vision for us as we uh, talk about crossing the Jordan is to have uh, some people that belong in a rescue mission uh, coming to church, and not only coming to church, but serving in church, uh, being active in church, uh, people who with, uh, with sordid pasts, uh, people whose sins are known, whereas yours and mine sometimes are a little more hidden, uh, people that uh, don't look the same way, look a little more disheveled, uh, maybe they smell like cigarette smoke, uh, maybe the, 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 they, they, they have wild weekends, and I'm not condoning anything that, that runs uh, counter to God's word and God's commands, but I'm saying that with the blood, we need to go out and find Rahab's. 
with the blood and the salvation and the forgiveness and the redemption and the transformation of the power of God through his Holy Spirit, we need to intentionally, as Jesus did, go find the fishermen, go find the lame, go find the lepers, go find the woman at the well. We need to seek out people who need the blood and invite them in. I didn't, I didn't say be polite. I didn't say uh, paste a fake smile on. I said invite them in. And this is why today a lot of Christians, uh, a lot of churches prefer to stay in the wilderness. Because in the wilderness, you can either be open and welcoming and deny the blood or you can be uh, fervent in, 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 in insisting that people claim the blood, but be closed off and not welcoming. And both of those are way more comfortable for modern churches to either fall to the right hand or to the left than to walk in God's way and say, Rahab, we love you, we want you to be saved, but there's only one way, you either do it or you don't, here's your invitation. So I pray, as we talked about crossing the Jordan, that I, that Pastor Jessica, that our deacons, uh, that our music and song and worship leaders, uh, that, our, that our board members are willing to get in the water first. God showed the Israelites the first time at the uh, brink of the Red Sea, he said, stand still and see the deliverance of the Lord. This time he says, you've already seen my deliverance. If you really believe it, you go in. And so I pray for our leaders, for myself, that we will be willing to step into uncharted waters, to rushing, uh, overflowing, uh, uh, flood brim Jordan River, and step into those waters, having seen God work in the past and knowing that if he's calling us forward, he will work today. If he's in it, as the uh, Hebrew boys said in the fiery furnace, if he's in it, he will save us. But even if not, we will not worship that, uh, that image, Nebuchadnezzar. The point is for, for the leaders to go first, and the second the second thing I want to challenge everyone to is that we are looking in our lives, in our schools, at work, in, in, in the community, at, at our neighbors, at people we see in the store, if you can recognize them behind their masks, we're looking for people that w w with, with maybe a past or even a present that we don't know is agreeable to us. And we don't know what would be agreeable in the church, but we say, if you're interested in salvation, Jesus is offering it. And along with that salvation, that forgiveness for the past and the present, comes transformation for the future. There's one way to get it. Claim the blood. Have you claimed the blood? Have you claimed the blood? Have you claimed the blood? Have I claimed the blood? Let's join together and sing one last song before we're dismissed. <laughs>